Welcome to the Australian Water School webinar for today. We're going to be talking about the importance of 2D cell size for accurate hydraulic modelling. And our presenter today will be Chris Huxley from TwoFlow and his colleague Bill Syme will also be joining us. Great to see so many here participating in this webinar live today. For those who are watching the recorded version and you want to see the Q&A discussion and comments and questions, click on the YouTube description below the video. Now you'll see at the bottom there, Financial Review has awarded this group the most innovative of companies. I'd make a note of that because that's the regard with which these guys are held. So yes, thank you for joining us and look where you are all from, America, UK, Europe, oh, all over. It's just a fantastic roll up. Thank you so much for joining us and uh, I, I can't wait to get into this topic. Okay, let's get this cracking. So good to see you, Chris. Good to see you, Bill. Thanks so much for the time taken here. Chris is the principal engineer for BMT, the developers of TwoFlow, with over 15 years experience in the field of flood and stormwater modeling and floodplain management. Chris is a senior member of the Hydraulic Modeling Software Development Team, also an adjunct, adjunct lecturer at Central Queensland University where he teaches hydraulic modeling. So a great background panelist, Bill Syme. Great, Bill. Thank you for joining us also. Bill has a 30 years experience in flood hydraulics field. You say that fast, don't you? 30 years experience. <laughs> Mate, that is a great thing. TwoFlow Software was developed by Bill starting in 1989. Bill is a software business lead managing two flow products and associated services. So guys, thank you. Um, what part of the world are you from? Uh, we're, both, we're both from Brisbane. Yeah. Oh, good. Up in sunny Queensland. Doesn't Brisbane do well? <laughs> They're the best <laughs> modelers in the business in one city. <laughs> Up in Queensland, north of Australia. I'm down to South Australia. And um, um, it's wonderful to welcome you guys and all the international guests that are with us today. What makes you do this, Chris? I've always had a love of water, so I loved meteorology as a kid, but then yep. more recently, you know, now I actually know what I'm talking about. I love sharing information. <laughs> yeah, that, makes a, that, that does help you. Yep. And Bill, Bill, what about yourself? Oh, same deal. I think yep. people know the answer, but I just have always loved water, love um, recreation, yep. water yep. things, and to have that in my workplace is fantastic after all but, these years. Yeah. Yep. I'm on 10 acres. I was a map maker from, <laughs> from, from way back when I was here, yeah, but water is the critical element in, in making 10 acres come to life and and uh, it's wonderful i've been walking around this morning just going right i've got to fix that anyway <laughs> enough of all the chit chat look at this you, you did the poll for us everyone thanks so much uh it's a great outcome to see what sector you're from did you expect this chris bill 60 percent mostly from co commercial consulting i uh, expected the Probably. consulting mix there yep uh good yep. coverage in terms of yep. experience yep oh so a good, good answer there for question three, result, reliability, accuracy. Um, I'm, I'm, right. I was hoping that'd be the right, that'd be right. answer. Right. Come back. For with those of you listening to this recording, question three that Chris, Chris is referring to is what most influences job, your all. choice of cell size in the models you develop? <laughs> reliability, <laughs> accuracy. I love that. You're right. Uh, and then the last one there, uh, as part of your model development activities, do you scenario test different cell sizes as a way to optimize your model design? Oh, there's actually quite a bit of coverage there. There is across all the answers. Good, um, good hopefully, spread. following this presentation, we'll see people moving towards that yes, always yeah. answer at least once at the start of your project, just so you can lock in yep. a yep. good, accurate result. I have to admit, though, you know, for the first half of my career, um, I probably would, would have sat in the twenty-five percent to fifty percent right as well. Right, so it's, it's pretty common. <laughs> and that second question is: most of the people with us today have had more than five sorry one at least one third have had more than five years experience yeah yeah excellent well over half beyond, mm, beyond two years yeah that's great thank you for answering those questions that really helps us as we guide this um uh guide this webinar that's fantastic i think without further ado we get cracking with this chris will speak bill will answer any questions or any comments you have there but let's get the discussion going and uh, look we'll hand right over to you both now thanks a lot chris excellent thank you trevor thanks very much Thank you for joining me today. Look, this presentation actually has evolved with time. I, I gave a similar presentation a few years ago, but as those people who have more than five years of experience would know, this industry is very much evolving and currently it's going through a real growth phase. And with that growth phase, we need to look at what we're doing again and make sure that the processes and applications and ways that we do our work are still applicable to those new technologies. Look, let's get straight into it. There's essentially three sections to the presentation. Uh, I'll start by setting the industry guideline context. Uh, back in 2012, there was a project done under the banner of Australian Rainfall and Runoff that 
has really led the way in terms of guiding how we do our hydraulic modeling here in Australia. Um, there are similar guideline documents around the world. I noticed that there was something published recently by the Federal Highways in the USA, for example. The methodology I'm using to determine the accuracy of my scenario tests is a concept called result convergence. Uh, so since that's the underlying approach I'm using to determine accuracy, uh, I'll just present a slide that defines what result convergence is for those who don't know. Following that, we'll then do some scenario testing. And I have three separate test cases here. Uh, I'll have a regional dam failure simulation, an urban direct rainfall simulation, and then a new one uh, which I've added for this presentation is a high conveyance river channel situation. And with that third one, I'm actually going to be doing a comparison between the old traditional flat cell topography approach and the more contemporary newer subgrid sampling approach. Uh, so we can see what the, the difference in result is between the two. Let's start with the guidelines. If you're in Australia, you should be aware of this. I hope you are aware of it. Uh, if you're from outside Australia, I highly recommend you looking up these guideline documents. Over the course of, oh, it's over a decade now, there's been a full revision of Australia's guidelines relating to hydrology and also hydraulics. On the left there, that's the overarching document which relates to hydraulic modeling, uh, book six of Australian rainfall and runoff. Preceding the writing of that document, there was a project report that was written, which is the one on the right there that's referred to as project 15. If you're a new modeler, less than five years experience and you haven't come across this report, I highly recommend reading it. It's about 300 pages or so of really useful practical advice, how you should go through all of your hydraulic modeling. Um, by comparison, that document on the left is actually at a lot more high level. So you, you miss out on those details a little bit if, you, if you're not familiar with the Project 15 report. So um, for the practical practitioners out there, please look back at that Project 15 report for um, some really good advice. Now of those 300 pages, there's one which looks at cell size. And it's a really, you know, it's literally one page out of 300, but it's a very important topic. The guideline states, and this is in section 10.5.2, that when you're selecting an appropriate cell size for your modeling, you need to consider a few different things. There's the scale of the topographic and flow phenomena, your des desired level of output detail, the length of the event time and also your simulation time, and also the size of your area of interest. Uh, find that then that there is also a table which provides some broad recommendations for different conditions. Uh, for if your area of interest relates to flow in a channel, then you should be trying to achieve greater than five grid cell or mesh elements laterally across the channel. If you're modeling urban situations, then typically the cell size range is, is between 10 and five meters, uh, though up to 10 has worked in some cases. And in the floodplain uh, where your conveyance is typically less and you, you know, milder flow conditions, uh, cell sizes of 10, even up to 50 meters are typically okay. Sometimes up to 20, uh, 200 meters, sorry, they, they state. The link at the bottom there, that'll take you to the project 15 report if you haven't come across it previously. Uh, so look back at this presentation in the, in the recording uh, if you didn't catch that. So the thrust of this presentation, we'll be looking at these guideline recommendations using scenario testing for real world cases uh, to test whether they result in a converged solution. What do I mean by a converged solution? Uh, a bit of a quote, I can't actually remember where I got this from. I think it might've been Wikipedia. <laughs> um, what is result convergence? In well-designed modeling software, convergence refers to the tendency for model results to trend towards a common answer as a parameter's definition resolution increases. So if we look at the image on the right there, who knows what that is? You know, that's quite coarse resolution. We don't know what the answer is or what, what it's trying to represent. I double the resolution. You can see we can, if you squint, you might actually be able to work out what that is. Hard the resolution again, it's coming into clarity a bit further. And then you'll get to a point here, this is still actually quite a coarse resolution, but you'll get to a point where you can see the image and the results at this resolution are not dissimilar to that of the finest resolution. And it's when you reach that tipping point that we say that you have a converged result. Um, that's my son there, he's experiencing his first flood, very excited. <laughs> 
Okay, why is it worth talking about though? Uh, there's a few reasons. First of all, we all know that when you model to a really high resolution, it translates to lots of cells. And as a result, you'll get long simulation times. So with that in mind, you want the lowest resolution possible that demonstrates no loss of accuracy. Um, and then in turn, will produce the fastest simulation for you. Um, so from a project perspective, it's all about getting the result as quick as possible without adversely impacting your results. And put simply, look, this is a necessary task during every single project at that model development phase. When you're first developing a model, you should be going through this sort of cell size testing that I'll demonstrate in the following slides. Let's jump straight into the test cases. Uh, test case number one, this is a regional rural dam failure simulation. Uh, the data set has come from the United Kingdom Environment Agency. They, um, I guess, ran the benchmark study, which is shown on the right there back in the, oh, was it 2012, I think from memory. And one of their benchmark cases was this, this one here, it was benchmark test five. Uh, a dam failure situation passing down a, a valley. The length of that valley is in the order of, I think it was around about 16 kilometers. There is a scale bar there. I'd have to <laughs> um, measure it out to get the exact length there, but from memory it was about 16 kilometers. The simulation was run for a duration of 30 hours, even though the inflow hydrograph only went for say 100 minutes. And that's the time required for that flood wave to propagate all the way down to those benchmark or the result reporting locations at 0.4 and 5. Uh, for this analysis, I'll be essentially running a model of this exact same scenario of this test case with different cell size resolutions and just comparing results at reporting location four and five. And I've chosen those specifically because they're far enough downstream that any model artifacts due to your cell size changes upstream should propagate through down to those locations. So we should, I guess, get an amplified measure of whether convergence is achieved or not. This modeling was done with TwoFlow HPC uh, and the GPU card I used there is listed. It was the, um, the GTX 180 Ti, one of the fastest cards. Uh, although it's just recently been, been picked by some new architecture and by NVIDIA. This here is just an animation just showing what we're modeling. So the water flows from left to right down through the river valley and ponds down towards the bottom there. So once again, that's over a 30 hour duration. With all this convergence testing, I'm always starting from the smallest cell size. So we should hopefully <laughs> get an accurate res uh, result at those smaller cell sizes, because um, I guess you're picking up the topographic features to the highest resolution possible. Uh, and here's the results for a 10 meter resolution model. The mesh is shown in the top left the 10 meter resolution translated to 188,000 cells. That run took 280 so seconds. And the results for both of those reporting locations are shown. This is just the water level versus time result in a hydrograph. Okay, now I've overlaid the 20 meter cell resolution result. And you can see that there's no discernible difference in result at those two reporting locations. So based on that, I could confidently say that, yes, we have a converged solution. Whether I ran at a 10 meter resolution or 20 would make no difference, apart from I've just achieved a faster run time. This model now runs in 98 seconds. Uh, 50 meter resolution, you can see the meshes course are up in the top left again, um, and no discernible difference in result. Uh, so here we go. You could, you could definitely run this 50 meter resolution and be confident the results are correct. Even 100 meter, even a 100 meter cell resolution converges to a common answer. When we start going bigger than that though, at 150 and 250, the resolution is, is simply too coarse uh, and we don't get an accurate result. And you can see that, especially at reporting location five in the top right, where the orange and the pink line has shifted away from all the other results. So look, just a, a quick result discussion summary from those results. We found that we got convergence when the cell resolution was less than 
100 meters by 100 meters. Um, now those numbers actually sound a whole lot larger than what was listed in the guideline document. That being said, because we're, it, it's important to consider the, um, I guess the flow mechanisms relative to the features that we're modeling here. And within that context, the flow magnitude relative to the valley cross section as a whole means that it's akin to an open channel. Um, and when you move to that mindset, all of a sudden you find that that 100 by 100 meter cell translates to more than five cells across the valley. Uh, and yes, you know, we agree with that guideline but the results confirm that the recommendations within the guideline are sound and correct. Okay, test case number two. Uh, this one here is an urban direct rainfall model. Uh, the model size is 54 square kilometers and it's been run using a hypothetical storm. The Heide graph is shown there. Uh, once again, it's direct rainfall. So we're applying rainfall to every single cell in the model and the model then routes it and um, does the hydraulic calculations. In addition to the overland flow, uh, we also have some 1D open channels in there where the cell resolution was too coarse for the features within those open channels. And there's also in the order of around about, oh, I'm stretching my memory here, I think it's two or 3,000 1D pipes for the underground urban pipe network in this model. That was the topography. This is now the land use. Just so you can get a sense of the scale. Each of those red dots there uh, is a property, is a building. I've run five different test scenarios. Uh, this was in the US, so it was originally developed in feet, uh, but I've translated that to metric units roughly. Um, so going from three meters up to 15. And you can see that translates to a, a change in model size from up around 6 million cells down to about 200,000. Once again, I've used 24 HPC and I've used the same GPU card as in the previous simulation. It was the GTX 1080 Ti. What you can see here are the three meter cell resolution results. Uh, so you've got a really nice definition of the flood of the flow down through the, um, the road network. <clears throat> Sorry, I was got a drink. Down through the road network. Once again, in the order of 6 million cells, this simulation took over nine hours to run. Uh, so a, a decent amount of time. It's not unexpected given the number of cells we're dealing with. Okay, I've, I've now actually updated that image on the right with the four and a half meter cell resolution results. I'll just step back so you can see the change in result. So looking at the image on the right there, I'll move on to the next slide. And that's what happens when you increase that resolution from a three meter resolution to a four and a half meter resolution. If I do a analysis of those two result data sets by subtracting the grid raster result from one model to the next. Um, so you're doing a, a calculation across the entire model domain here, you can um, do an analysis to create these histogram plots, which I'm showing on the bottom left. And the idea here is I'm trying to achieve less than plus or minus 0.25 of a foot. So a quarter of a foot. Um, what's that? That's, you know, in the order of plus or minus 10 centimeters. And in this situation here, moving from the three meter resolution to the four and a half was able to achieve a result that conformed within that tolerance uh, in 85% of cases. Uh, I'd say that's a converged result. I'd be happy running at the four and a half meter resolution in this situation. Here we have the six meter resolution result. Uh, and you'll see that image on the right, it didn't change dramatically. Uh, and also that analysis of the peak water level results is displayed on the left there. And we're getting around about 80% correlation with that finest resolution simulation. This model though ran, instead of in nine hours, ran in 1.8 hours, a whole lot quicker. Here we have the nine meter result. Looking at the image on the right, it doesn't look dissimilar to the earlier ones. That being said, when you actually do an analysis of these results versus uh, the finer resolution, we're only getting around about 55, 56% correlation with those 
um, finer, more accurate results. And I'd go so far as to say that these results don't converge. Um, so this is not a simulation resolution, not a resolution I'd be using in my modeling. We can go further out, you know, 15 meter, it's not surprising. These results now do definitely look different from those original results. Okay, so a little bit of discussion about these. Uh, so we found that the result converged to a common solution when we're working at less than a 20 foot resolution. That's what I was, it? I got that wrong. Oh, 20 foot, so six meter resolution. Uh, considering that, uh, then yeah, look, these test results once again agree with the guideline recommendations. That being said, which, you know, in a practical sense for a project, the resolution that someone should be choosing shouldn't just be based on this, this um, convergence testing. It also needs to consider the, the modeling objectives of a project. If I was using this model for flood forecasting versus um, design and planning, then the selected set of cell resolution I use may be different. I'd probably use the highest resolution for design and planning uh, for flood forecasting because I want my simulations to run as quick as possible. I'd probably stick with that 20 foot resolution or six meter resolution. Now, a question is, why is finite resolution necessary in this case? Um, put simply, look, urban areas have lots of obstructions and finer resolution calculations that are just needed to represent that high variation in flow behavior. I'm not just talking about depth and level here, but more importantly, probably, I'm talking about the velocities. Uh, so because of that, it's necessary for us to model at a higher resolution. The test case scenarios that I've shown you to date have all used the tra traditional flatbed cell design. It hasn't used subgrid sampling. Uh, I called a webinar, oh, it was probably maybe two years ago. Um, it was actually a HECRAS webinar and there was a suggestion there that you can't get convergence with a flatbed elevation cell approach. And that's actually completely wrong. You still can. Um, I'm not sure <laughs> where, where that uh, comment came from. But, you know, just to get a sense of how does subgrid sampling compare to that traditional flat cell topography approach, I've gone and done some testing. So we can base our um, opinions here on some, some real data. Uh, on the left, that's your traditional flat cell approach where your volume for the entire cell is based on the elevation at the cell center. And when water breaks from one cell to the next is defined at the cell face, just via a single point. And on the right there, we have you know, the neural alternative, which is using the subgrid sampling schema, where we have a curve that defines the volume within each cell and also uh, the cross-section width, I guess, across each face. So schematically, if we were just to plot the elevations, that's what this image is showing here. On the right, subgrid sampling, you get a much nicer definition of the features. On the left, it's a little bit more granular, um, just because you're picking up a single elevation in the center of the cell to define what this whole cell represents volumetrically. The test case I'll be using here is from the Brisbane River 2011 flood. Um, I've actually chosen this test case because it's hydraulically really challenging. Uh, high flows, so in the order of 9,000 um, cubic meters per second, um, where we have a, a really good level of certainty about those flows because they were uh, measured via ADCP. We have great calibration data. This is just a small segment of the river where there's, I'd say, what, around about a dozen recorded elevation, uh, peak water elevations, and also a, a gauge level in there. Um, more broadly, you know, there was hundreds, if not thousands of recorded marks. So very good data to base it on. But once again, just circling back to what I was saying previously, for hydraulic modeling, it's a really challenging test scenario because the river depth is up in the order of 30 meters deep. The river velocity is at say around five meters or up to five meters per second. And with all the river bends um, in the lower part of the river there, you've got really high loss characteristics. Uh, so if you can get a model to work in this situation, you're doing something really well. I'll use a different approach this time to test the cell convergence, cell size convergence. This time I'll be using a long section approach and I'm just presenting the long section there. So you can see from the top, that 
they'll be 0, 0.0 transitioning down to the bottom, which is at 10,000 meters or 10 kilometers downstream from the start of the long section. Let's look at some results. On the left, all of the graphs on the left will be using the traditional cell size design, uh, cell design, and all of the graphs on the right will be using subgrid sampling. This here is the 20 meter model result, 20 meter cell resolution result. That's the 30 meter cell resolution result. It's quite good agreement in both cases, actually. 40 meter, uh, I'd say that subgrid sampling is outperforming traditional a little bit, but you know, the answer is still quite good in both. Um, when you take consideration of the, um, the levels on, on the left there, the scale of the levels, I should say. Uh, out to 60 meters. Here's when you start seeing a divergence in result between that traditional approach and the subgrid sampling. With the subgrid sampling simulation, you know, those results are still within, you know, 10 to, to 15 centimeters of that target. Whereas with the traditional cell design, it's diverging a bit more than that. And going coarser again, and then coarser further, um, you can see that the big difference between those two cell schema approaches. Uh, so quick, look, a quick discussion. Uh, it needs to be noted that this, this last test case is a really challenging hydraulic um, modeling test case for the fact that it's got really deep flow and it's got really turbulent conditions. If you caught Bill Simon's presentation, it would have been two months ago. Uh, he introduced the issue, or maybe it was Greg's one month ago, the issue with using small cell sizes where the water depth exceeds the size of the cell, which has traditionally due, been due to the eddy viscosity or the subgrid turbulence scheme. We're actually now in a space where that is no longer an issue. Um, which is really really positive. In all of those results, we achieved convergence when there was more than seven cells across channel, which is slightly more than the guideline value, um, but it's not really a surprise given the challenging hydraulic conditions. And the subgrid sample situation really did improve the results relative to the, the traditional approach. Have to ask the question though, why doesn't a single SGS cell covering the full width of the river channel achieve an accurate result? Uh, I've got the results mapped there on the left with just two calibration marks shown on the inside and the outside of the bend. And you can see it, there's, what is that? That's, that's around about what, 0.6 of a meter difference between the water level at the inside of the bend and the outside. And that's due entirely, I guess, due to momentum of the water moving around the bend um, and loading up on the outside there. Moving to SGS, we do get a much better definition of the volume within each cell uh, and the variation in volume at different depths. We definitely get a, a better representation of the flow area when water passes between cells. Uh, and if you caught Bill's presentation a few months back again, um, that does translate to there being no grid rotation loss artifacts, which is a, definitely a positive. The thing to keep in mind though, is that we're still only calculating a single velocity um, calculation at a point on each cell face. Uh, and because of that, you need to have sufficient representation of those velocity calculations across your river uh, to achieve an accurate result. So let's look at that here. Here, here I think this was the perhaps the 100 meter result. Um, if you would just look at your water level and your depth results, things look amazing. That's the image on the right there, you know, because subgrid sampling means you can go down to a really nice output resolution. But computationally, for velocity, um, things are, are really very coarse here. And that's what's shown on the, the right there. And this is a perfect example where you need to be careful not to be tricked by your results. You still need to think, okay, are my results accurate? So there you can see velocity results quite coarse. And as you increase your resolution, obviously the distribution of velocity across channel and around that bend improves in accuracy significantly. So yeah, the, the effectiveness of SGS is very much influenced by that single cell velocity calculation per face in conveyance dominated areas like this. It's worthwhile noting that's not an issue if you're in a storage dominated area, like in the floodplain, you could have quite big cells out there um, and the results would still be accurate because it's storage dominated. It's, it's not velocity dominated. 
With that in mind, what's the solution? Uh, Quadtree, and, and that's what's shown on the right there. It's where you can refine your cell resolution where needed uh, to achieve an accurate result. If you wanna know more about Quadtree, I won't go into too much detail here. Please go to that YouTube channel. I'll, I'll show it on this slide as well as the next one so you've got time to write it down. Uh, it's about a 10 minute presentation where I talk through how Quadtree is implemented within Tuflow, but then also how it impacts result accuracy and also simulation speed uh, for, I think it was just two test cases there. One was an urban one and then one was a, a broader floodplain scenario. Uh, and this is an example, this is actually taken from that presentation where we recognize that we need higher the highest resolution in a, a small tributary within the, the model, a medium resolution within the river channel, and then we could get away with quite a coarse resolution out in the floodplain with no loss of accuracy compared to if we just ran the whole model at a very fine resolution. And it meant we, I, I, I'm testing my memory here, but I think we got the simulation speed about four times faster by doing that. So presentation conclusions here. Uh, the Australian Rainfall and Runoff Guideline is very useful. And if you haven't read Project 15, I recommend you do so. Uh, you'll get a lot out of it. Result convergence testing, like what I've shown here today, is a necessary task on all projects at that model development phase. Uh, I've presented three different ways you can do it. You can plot up your water levels with time, uh, do an analysis over your entire max water level grid, uh, or alternatively, um, do long section plots down rivers. You know, there's a lot of different ways to, to do this. Look, result convergence is possible with both the traditional and also the subgrid sampled methods. That being said, the subgrid sampled method does converge to a common answer at a larger cell size. And with that, you know, we can get models that run quicker. Uh, another thing to note is, yeah, with an appropriate turbulence closure scheme, cell sizes and small, smaller than the water depth is now acceptable. So we're moving into a whole new realm of what's possible now. And in conveyance dominated areas, by combining subgrid sampling with quad tree, uh, you'll get the most accurate results and the faster simulation speeds. Uh, so if you find that subgrid sampling um, across with a single resolution across your entire model is still running too slow, then just pull in quad tree and just get a little bit smarter about how you define your mesh resolution in different regions. All right, right on time there. 29 minutes, 30 minutes. Uh, that concludes the presentation. Uh, Trevor. Wonderful. And Bill. It's just so much in that. You can tell you've been a lot of, lot of places over the last few years. And also Bill from the, uh, I'm watching the Q and A questions, just it's riveting. It's going through. You, 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 your fingers, my fingers must be red hot, Bill. It's fantastic to see this. I appreciate the, uh, the case studies and the examples, extremely help, helpful going by the, the questions. And thanks everybody for your questions. I can tell you deeply into this. Um, where should we start? There's six open questions here and quite a few answered questions. If you'd like to press the Q&A uh, okay. icon at the bottom of your screen, on the screen you'll see. Yeah, so, see them. so Chris, I've left some, the ones near the top are, um, <coughs> yes, okay. ones near the top, maybe if you start with those, I'll sort okay. of, they're more particular so one there. presentation. So regarding one. the Brisbane River model, did you test two meters and five meter grid sizes with SGS? As part of this testing, I can, I can say I didn't, um, that being said, there have been some models that have been done by others that I think have gone down to that resolution. Is that correct, Bill? Is that? Uh, I'll just say that again, Chris. Sorry, I was typing. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, there were some others in the team that were, were reviewing. Oh, yeah, I think Greg's gone down to um, five metres. I'm not sure whether they've done two. I mean, it's a very, yeah. very deep river system, 30 metres, four or five metres per second. So two metres getting extremely small. From, from memory, in, in that situation, um, HPC had to run at a, at a reduced... CFL number to get yeah, a Yeah, nice so the result. diffusion number starts to kick in when you have that very high ratio. The good thing these days is that you can now model with cell sizes much smaller than the depth. That was always a limitation, not just of two flow, but all 2D schemes. So um, you can now push down to those very, very fine cell sizes and get consistent results, which is yeah. uh, pretty exciting if you um, need that sort of resolution. Yeah. Uh, along the same I guess, line of thought as the result convergence testing for cell size. Another good test is also to 
run these same scenario testing approach for time step. Um, so if you're using HPC, you know, you could reduce that CFL number from one, which is the default down to 0.8. Uh, or if you're using Tufo Classic, you know, just halve your time step and just see how the results change. And that's another parameter where you use this sort of testing. Sounds good. Uh, so, yep. Yeah, and so next one, what is the source elevation model for urban terrain? Oops, it's moved. Yeah. With buildings. How was such detailed DTM generated? I was very fortunate that the city who commissioned that work provided it. <laughs> um, yeah, so w w when they did the data collection, they just made sure that buildings were captured. Next one is, hi, Chris, in the second case, did you use SGS? I didn't, no, that was using the traditional approach. So the first two used just the traditional approach. And then for the third one, I introduced SGS and traditional just to see the difference. Uh, question, isn't it necessary to use less than two meter cell size for urban modeling? Not in all cases, no, no. Look, um, at the end of the day, it, what you need to do is do this cell size convergence testing for your projects and that'll answer that question for you. Um, in some situations, it might the answer might be yes, if you've got really fine features that you need to capture relative to your flow magnitude. But, um, you know, in many cases, it's just not necessary. So there's one there from Vimal Sharma. Okay, for Riverine model, why we need to go for high resolution where I don't have any dam breaching effect. So why do we need to go for the high resolution? Um, we don't have any dam breaching effect. Um, the, the, the model that we just did then was, that was a, a catchment flood. So still flooding conditions. I don't actually quite understand. Maybe no, then I'll, then I'll uh, maybe put put some more detail around that question. But now we'll come back to that again. Shall we do that, uh, Bill, Chris? Yeah, yeah. If you can add some more details, that'd be great. Okay, one here from Andrew. Uh, Chris, something you alluded to during your presentation. When you're dealing with very deep flow, is there any limit to cell size with respect to flow depth? Is there a specific point at which the shallow water equations will not apply? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, so the background behind this, uh, Greg, who presented last month, covered in the new release presentations for two flow. Uh, what traditionally you need to make sure that your cell size didn't get smaller than your flow depth. Okay. So if you're dealing with, uh, let's say the Brisbane river case, water depths of 30 meters, then your cell size shouldn't go smaller than 30 meters. And the reason for that is, is there's a, a term within the shallow water equation which, which deals with turbulence, which is at a finer scale than what that cell is. Now, when your cell size becomes small than depth, using the old traditional Smagorinsky approach, that would actually transition down to a zero turbulence state, which isn't right. Um, now moving to the new Wu turbulence model that Greg spent a few years to um, introduce into two flow in the last release, um, we can actually go well beyond um, that criteria. I haven't found the bottom limit to that yet. Uh, need, that's something we need to look into. Yep. So, so sorry, I, I'm just uh, catching up then. I was sort of looking at some other, other questions. Was that Michael's, uh, Shipioni's question? That no, no, that was no, Michael. That was a Andrew. Uh, sorry. Okay. Right. Yeah. That's, okay. that's all right. Uh, okay. I see. Yeah. Which one do you want to go we'll to we'll next, go, Bill? We'll go for Michael, maybe. Yep, um, so it looks okay. like a good one. Thank you, Michael. I've done modeling on the Rio Grande River in Texas. Generally, the floodplain is 2.5 miles wide. The low flow channel is approximately 500 feet wide. It migrates considerably. The existing LIDAR data is at one meter resolution. I modeled scale bollards in the floodplain at a 656 resolution. These bollards have a space of 8.5 feet between. I used a cell size of 25 feet for the floodplain reduced down to two foot when I go to the bollards, but naturally this resulted in a large number of cells. Yeah, spot on. Um, bec literally because of this um, really common situation where you'll have fine scale features associated with bridges, which some people think necessi necessi necessitates you to go down to a really small cell size. Um, we've provided an alternative solution to that where we have what we call um, layered flow constriction and, and form loss entries into two flow. So at a macro scale, you can model all of those loss characteristics due to the bridge. 
and also maintain a higher cell size. So yeah. it, it makes your models run a lot quicker. Um, there was a HECRAS model that we converted across to two flow last year, um, which used that really small cell approach due to a bridge and it was taking 30 days to run the cloud. Yeah. Um, running it, you know, a more appropriate cell size and just using form loss inputs, yeah. it ran in a few minutes. Yep. Um, Michael makes a, um, if you go into the- I show all. Show yeah. all, yeah. Uh, perhaps the question should have been, would using SGS sub, subgrid, SGS, be a better way to model this? Uh, yes and no. <laughs> um, so so the, the depth is up to 50 feet in the channel and 14 feet in the overbank areas. Yep. Yeah, that's a really yeah, should difficult, I have used difficult situation. Yes. Um, you, you should have used SGS, but I wouldn't have assumed that those bollard features would be captured in the SGS treatment of the topography. You really need to move to a form loss approach to get those losses if you're not going to transition down your, your cell sizes. Yep. Um, it would You would have struggled to maintain something stable at those cell sizes, I imagine. So next. Okay. Um, Hi, Chris. Please. What's the impact of solver, yep. i.e. FEM versus FVM versus FOF on cell size in hydraulic modelling? Bill's probably better suited to answering that one than I. Um, he's much closer to all the different schemes. Bill, do you want to chime in on that? Uh, which one? So the second the, one the now, question but... is, how does the type of solver influence the cell size? You know, finite element versus finite volume versus finite difference. Uh, the type of solver doesn't really affect the cell size. Ultimately, the cell size should be driven by um, the, um, the resolution of the topography, the roughnesses, basically your input data. So if you've got a lot of variation in topography in a key flow path, so you don't, for example, put one or two cells across a river, um, a river. you always need to have a bunch of cells. SGS helps enormously with that, but if you have access to subgrid sampling, um, but not the type of solver, doesn't have a big effect. Um, some, some of the implicit solvers like Tiflo Classic can handle more cells, or sorry, handle less cells across the main flow path just by nature of their solution. Um, but you don't, it's not really, come, doesn't really come down to the type of solver. It's all about your defining your input data um, suffici sufficiently accurately for what you want to do. So okay. what about from, the anonymous, apart from the calculation yeah, speed, from the how does, does two-flow results compare to HECRAS 2D results? Have cell size change comparisons been done between the two software packages? There's, there's been lots of comparisons been un, done out there. Um, so you'll find a few different documents. Um, that UK benchmark study that I presented, there's heck of got the same, um, they've done benchmark against the same data sets. In fact, the um, that damn failure one, the, the reason why I modeled that with it, a couple of different cell resolutions was because it was on um, the predecessor to the AWS was in, in Ice Warm as part of, I think, the HECRAS release maybe two years ago. Um, those same results for those resolutions were presented there and there was the suggestion that your traditional cell, flatbed cell result didn't converge to a common answer, um, which I just didn't believe and so that's what pushed me down that path to test, you know, do we converge? And we do. Um, so, yeah, look, the, the, there is comparisons out there that being said it's not really our place to 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 comment on that whether yep. whether one is better or not yeah um, that's that's fine uh gurmeet singh the one further down bill what are your recommendations on what models are you okay bill on this one uh, uh so which one uh, uh gurmeet's uh okay. oh yeah what are your recommendations on what models to use for 2d, 2D hydraulic modeling for rural areas um, well, obviously, I'm going to recommend two flow, but there's um, there's other good ones around. <laughs> I'd be surprised if you didn't say that, Bill. <laughs> um, look, you know, as long as you're running with the um, the full 2D schemes that are using a second order solution, so they're not numerically dispersive, they have a good turbulence scheme. There's only, to be honest, a handful of those, and um, yeah, there's a lot of uh, models that pretend to be good 2D solutions, but they're not really. If, if it's very, very calm, steady water, if it's more like a backwater, um, you know, they might be okay. And I'm just replying to someone who's been using the diffusion wave approximation. Never, ever use the diffusion wave approximation. <laughs> it is always going to be um, wrong. Um, yeah. And yeah, yeah, just don't go there. 
yeah. unless you've got want to get a very very uh, rough quick answer uh, we, we don't offer diffusion wave because it's just it's so far from reality you shouldn't be using it yep, yep. No, that's right uh can we just do one quick one easy to do helen fairweather says what presentation is chris referring to that greg gave last month there'll be many others helen also that probably ask that question uh so it gives a bit of a rundown chris on what greg yeah was look doing last month. Greg, greg gave one last month it was i think it was Excellent. on the 16th greg Collicut, of, Collicut, uh, yeah. greg, greg collicutt and his was based on um, hardware trends yep. for hydraulic modeling. So you should find a recording of that on the AWS yeah. website. It will be maybe, um, uh, Joel, uh, AWS, maybe we can put a, um, a note on the chat line for that, um, a link for that uh, website, uh, that uh, webinar on the chat line. That'd be great if that was possible, Joel. Um, be great. All right. Uh, where should we go to next? Uh, okay. Um, let's see. Could... Could TUFO used to model the, the dam break analysis and determine the downstream cross section? Um, yep, it's perfectly well suited to it. Yep. Um, particularly HPC. Um, that's the, uh, the solver that I used in all this benchmarking. It's yep. a second order scheme. Um, it's unconditionally stable, so it'll refine its time step based on the hydraulic conditions uh, yep. using a current number, diffusion number, and a celerity number. Um, yep. It's re really well suited to that style of analysis. The next one follows straight from it. And can it calculate the flood arrival time? Yep, absolutely. Um, that's an output. Like if you, um, there, there's a command in TwoFlow where you can specify different trigger water levels, which that would relate to. So sometimes you might be interested in, okay, when does something first get wet versus um, something that's say 0.3 of a meter high. Um, so you can, basically turn those switches on for it to track that information. And it'll also, too far also tell you the duration, like in some instances, um, it's really important to know how long something remains wet in rural environments like uh, cane fields. If you've got water over the cane fields for I say five days at 25 degrees, you know, they all die. So <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All, all those sorts of outputs are covered, yes. Yep, that sounds good. Um, where are we headed to? Derek has said, would an upper limit to cell size be determined? Oh, oh, okay, you're on the ball with that. Yep, no worries. Yeah, Thank you, Bill. That yeah. no, that's all right. Leave that one go. Where should we go? Tim's question, what, what is a recommended grid size to accurately model flows within the urban road network, given that they comprise the main surface flood flow path in urban areas? Yeah, look, you'll just have to do the convergence testing for your particular situation. Um, you know, smaller roads might necessitate a smaller cell size. The thing that we have working for us now is with subgrid sampling, uh, you can pick up that road, the road features to a really nice degree of accuracy at, the, at a course of cell size than we could previously in that urban environment. Uh, so I'd recommend look, using subgrid sampling, definitely turning that on, uh, using Woo, so you get that, the no artifacts due to the orientation of your cells and just do the, the grid size testing. You, know, you might find that two, two to six meters is probably fine. Um, but once again, it depends on the scale of the feature that you're having to represent. Uh, what would we get to here? So is the it... bottom one there, so in case three that you use subgrid sampling, what was the subgrid sampling cell size? By default, TwoFile will actually use the resolution of the DM data set that you're using. Hmm. So I didn't look to see what that was. Uh, Bill, do you know what resolution the Brisbane yeah. DM was? Uh, very far, well, in, in bank, there's several DMs. In bank was a hydrographic survey. It was literally, it was sub, not, sub one meter, incredibly detailed. Um, and then once you got to overbank, it was, it was probably uh, from memory a five meter type resolution from LIDAR. So it was, it was, we, we fed a combination of data sets into that, that model. Yep, that sounds great. So uh, just so, the subgrid sampling varies depending on the, um, yeah, you can sample it off different data sets at different resolutions. Yeah, Gurmeet says, has, two, has two flow been applied for flood forecasting operational models? Yep. So, yes. Yeah, absolutely. And mm -hmm. yep. in most parts of the world, in Australia, it's been used in that capacity in the US. Um, yep. I know of a group from one of the universities in Taiwan that use it there. Yep. There was a, uh, a really nice package of work that was done for the World Bank in India, actually, who, what, what was that? That was the, was it the Bagmati River, I think, uh, which used two flow for flood forecasting and also operation. So yeah, it's all over the world. It's been used in that capacity. 
Um, back to Vmail at the bottom there, uh, the maximum convergence is three when we use full synthetic equation HECRAS 2D. What if I see the convergence more than three for 10 cells versus 100 cells, 2% from total cells? Should I say my model is unstable? I'm actually not even familiar with yeah, right. HECRAS well enough to provide yeah. an answer to that one. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you, Craig, you may, may be interested in commenting on that one. Um, Craig Price, if you wish to, I'll leave that with you and by, by all means everyone you, you understand you can just comment on these questions in q a q a um, area of um, this zoom all right we'll leave that and we're down to about the last five minutes so which one should we pick i'm doing the um the questions from a novice one from who? right yep that question oh, from a novice different okay. yep uh, uh, so, um, oh, I'm, I'm answering, answering keep, that one keep, now yeah keep okay. going. So keeping it for, for salinity model how to choose a dispersion coefficient for example the brisbane river estuary uh i'm not actually skilled I'm, I'm not knowledgeable enough on that subject to provide guidance that being said we have scheduled a webinar for i think it's february perhaps it's march it'll be it'll be run by michael barry which we're talking about water quality modeling. So if you can hold out until early next year, there'll be a session specifically talking about water quality modeling. Yeah. Yeah, like, is there anything you want to emphasize, Bill, that you think would be useful in the questions? Um, you've 38 to 40 questions you've been <laughs> handling, <laughs> handling in the answered size. Um, all I can say is they've been actually fantastic questions. That's what I would like to say. It's really it's a huge amount of discussion here. Thanks for asking my question. So previously, when this Magarinsky turbulence was applied, you had to keep your cell size to about the same as the flow depth, or no less than the flow depth. Hmm. Um, but now Bill has a new formulation for turbulence. So this doesn't apply, question mark. Can you tell me which two-flow release this was made? And, and the answer is the 2020 release. Right, yeah, yeah, good, excellent, e excellent, that's great. Um, right, a couple of minutes left, let's keep doing this, and, and if the questions are, oh, where'd go? Oh, Andrew, keep that in mind, only applies for version 2020, yeah, that's I'm it. doing Thank emails you, right now, so. Um, okay, which one is that? Chris can answer another one. Um, uh, for Morton Bay, yep. what, what should be the mesh size? Um, Oh, I can't. I can't say without no. knowing exactly what your modeling no. objective is, what your study area is. You yeah. Know. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I guess the okay. take-home message there is: do your convergence testing, and you'll know the you'll get the answer. <laughs> That's a good answer. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Taylor, uh, Taylor Dennison, what's the best way to do a convergence test with cell mesh refinement regions? Yeah. Okay. Look, the the way that I approach this is I usually start with models that are of a single cell resolution, because it, it literally takes seconds to transition from one resolution to another in two flows. So I'll get a full suite of models that are just a single resolution, um, gradually transitioning down to a, a finer resolution. Uh, from that, I should actually be able to see where the hydraulics diverge in different areas, and then that will inform where I need to implement uh, a finer resolution mesh. The and you can do that divergence analysis just by mapping the difference in your maximum water level grid. Uh, so if you color contour that, you'll see areas of red versus not red. And that's where you need to go down to a finer resolution for that discrete area. Great. Uh, pick a last question. Let's do it. This is wonderful. Your, your questions and, and discussion has been just so in depth. Thank you, everyone. Everyone. Nitish or maybe uh, okay, so if Email. I want velocity profile in the vertical direction for sediment calculation, how can I get it with only one cell, i.e. 30 meter depth, so you were talking about. Um, so yeah, 2D, two, two flow is a 2D depth average solution. So you're just getting a depth average velocity there. Um, if you're really interested in that vertical profile, you'd probably have to go to a 3D scheme, I guess. Uh, and two-flow FE, FE has that capability. You could you know, use the Sigma approach to define your 3D layering, and then you would you'd get your vertical definition of the velocity. Uh, in fact, Brisbane City Council did that for when they were designing the um, the river walk down through around New Farm. They were really interested in that right. vertical definition of velocity for the forces that would apply to the mm. different um, pylons.
You know, I, I wouldn't mind doing one more. Stephen Yu says, I've recently been introduced to flexible mesh modeling. Is it possible to give a, some comments about flexible mesh and quad tree between the two? Um, oh, that much of a muchness, really. <laughs> um, yeah, you do, uh, to, you do have to be careful. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the, the guys who make really nice flexible meshes, they'll, they'll use quads um, typically shaped to the direction of the main flow paths in the main flow paths and, and a mixture of triangles and quads out in where the flow is not so strong, and say in the floodplains or out in the ocean. Um, you have to put a, a really nice effort into making um, a nice looking mesh if you're going to get a good model result. Uh, just like Chris was showing today, it's really important you demonstrate the validity of your mesh by um, running a comparison with say a reduction in uh, mesh size by using finer quads and triangles. If you get the same results, that you're in a great space. But if you're seeing a difference in results, then you need to work on your mesh to make it more applicable. If it's got subgrid sampling, that might help, because you know, that tends to make your convergence much more effective. Most flexible mesh models don't tend to have subgrid sampling at this point. Mm. I, I, um, I typically yeah, be careful. Towards, yeah, yeah I, I turn towards quad tree for the due to the simplicity it is to set up. You know, it takes literally a minute or two minutes to implement quad tree. <laughs> Uh, in the past, when I've done flexible mesh modeling, there was a large effort involved to get a, a mesh that adequately defined all the features and had all those flow paths um, defined within the mesh itself. Uh, I have heard some whisperings around saying that for urban modeling, for example, you need to use flexible mesh to get around buildings and, and things like that and get the right result. Um, if you do your cell size conversions testing using quad tree, you'll see it you don't. Like that's, that's just not the truth. Um, so I find quad trees a lot more efficient. So that's my personal preference, but everyone has a personal preference. You know. Well, gentlemen, that has been brilliant. Everyone uh, on board today, thanks so much for all of your involvement. There are three groups, on-demand courses, webinars, and live training. It's just all happening here at Australian Water School, and I'm so glad you could join us today. Any wrap-up comments from yourself, Chris or Bill? Yeah, just thank you for joining us. <laughs> it's been a great, it's been yeah. a, a great time Thank together. You. Yep. Thanks again, everyone, for joining us. Please do uh, come to our next webinar. We'd love to see you. Bye for now. Mm -hmm.